What is up, everybody? My name is Kyle Matovic. I am the host of the In Liberty and Health podcast, where we talk all things liberty, health and wellness, and beyond. My hope is to encourage and spread the message of liberty and physical and mental well-being. I hope you enjoy all the topics we talk about with our guests. We're on all major streaming platforms, so please sit back, relax, and enjoy. Man, I'm doing as good as anyone can do getting buried by his 13-year-old son on leg day. <laughs> I'm not going to apologize for not being on this podcast because I got to go see Metallica. So if that's a problem, kiss my ass. Okay? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. The long-awaited and, um, you know, feels like it's been a couple of days since I started this podcast, but episode number 100, and I got two of my favorite people in the podcasting sphere with me today, uh, the great Courtney Turner and, of course, the great Tommy Sammons as well. Um, Tommy, how you doing, man? I'm good, dude. Good, good. Courtney? Doing well, doing well. Yeah. Good. Third podcast of the day. <laughs> Jeez. Ooh, she's busy today. Yeah, she's, I don't know how she does it. She's always doing different shows and she's, she's crazy. I don't know, man. I can't do three shows a day after two. I'm like, all right, I need like a steak and a glass of whiskey. I'm, I'm, I'm taft. I understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. I, I'll do two, but that third one, it's always tough. Mm-hmm. I remember the first time I ever tried to do two, I, uh, I was on vacation. And so I was recording with a friend of mine about microbreweries. So okay. I'd been outside at the pond fishing all day long. And then I come in at like noon and I'm, we're talking microbreweries. So I've been drinking while I'm fishing. I'm drinking now. I'm really drinking because we're talking microbreweries. Okay. And then I was supposed to record with Pete at two o'clock. And for some reason in my head, I thought it was three o'clock and he texted me and he was like, Hey dude, are we doing this? And I was like, Oh yeah. And so I did an entire show with Pete totally blasted out of my mind about the upcoming documentary of the monopoly <laughs> monopoly on violence i was so trash he he took the he took the audio afterwards and he's like dude i cleaned it up as much as i could but i there's not much i could do for that <laughs> i was like <laughs> i was so drunk i was like dude i'm so sorry it that just yeah. that day just kind of like snowballed on me i did not mean for that to happen yeah. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. I think the first time I ever drank on a show was uh, actually your show the other day when it was me, you, Reed, and uh, David. It was the first time I ever drank and did a podcast. I drink during every podcast. I just <laughs> don't always drink a lot. That just that time I just happened to have been drinking all day. <laughs> I really haven't drank on my own podcast, but the first time I was ever on another podcast, I think, yeah, I drank. <laughs> And, and, it, but the, the guy who did the podcast was, so, it was actually my birthday. And the guy who did the podcast was so drunk that he, he forgot to press record. Oh my God. So, <laughs> so my, he did this really like intense, long, long podcast and you didn't record any of it. Oh, but then we no. like, re, yeah, I know. And then we did it. We ended up doing a three part series. He didn't never aired the third part, but, um, but I was pretty drunk for those two as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, well that's a, a wonderful kind of start to i guess the doom and gloom kind of topic that we're going to be talking about today yeah um, i always say, no I always tonight, say you're but... not a you're not a real podcaster until you podcast drunk oh, I, I guess so well yeah. I, that was, I, my initiation was uh drinking and podcasting so before i even started podcast so for I my friends used to make fun of me because I used to get drunk and apparently I used to uh, go on tirades about how much I love Rand Paul. And this is back before I like knew anything about politics. So yeah, I still like Rand, but not as much as I used to. But yeah, I used to get drunk and talk about politics and give speeches. But yeah, I don't. I, I try not to do that too beer, much anymore. Beer goggles. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, anyways. He's defi- if I have enough to drink, he's definitely a 10. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. My, <laughs> at least well, by DC standards, right? Right. Well, you know what they say: no one's ugly after two a.m. Right? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it, going down that kind of line, yeah, I, I could definitely see it. Um, so, both Courtney and Tommy here, you guys have both um, kind of done dives on some of the conspiracy theory stuff, and not just stuff that sounds outlandish and ridiculous. Like you guys actually bring receipts 
and that's kind of what I ask for out of people when they start talking about some bizarro shit, because it's like, okay, well, I, I need to see evidence and people get offended when you ask them to provide evidence. But look, I, I'm sure you guys know just as well as I do. You shouldn't believe everything you see and you shouldn't believe everything you hear. So um, now I guess Courtney, you could start this one off. Um, what kind of got you interested in digging into some of the stuff kind of beneath the curtains so that's interesting. I I think, you know, I've always kind of been a person who asks a lot of questions. Uh, I was a philosophy major, you know, I ever, I did an independent study actually in philosophy in high school. So I've always kind of, philosophy doesn't give you a whole lot of answers. It's really about asking the questions. <laughs> and that's kind of just my personality. I, I think in the past few years, though, it, there's just been such flagrant hypocrisies. And uh, it was really hard to, you know, I, I think that I, I came into this from even from a really young age, you know, I mean, I tried to start a board uh, for like school choice when I was in sixth grade, I, I kind of naively thought that politics would solve problems. And I think I really had this notion that if we could get the right people kind of in office, then, you know, maybe we could fix some of what's going on. And certainly, I think really over the past few years, it's become, you know, so much more glaringly obvious that we have a lot less power in that regard than I once thought that we did. And so I started to really try and find out, what, well, who's pulling the strings? And, you know, if, if we're being fed so many lies, then where is the truth? And that's really, I think, where that process went for me and I I'm kind of ashamed to say because some of the things that I had I had people who kind of you know planted a lot of seeds and at the time I I was very resistant to it and then in the past few years kind of diving through I was starting to connect the dots of things that I had heard years ago and I'm like oh yeah this is how did I not see this before you know <laughs> I, I was kind of ashamed of myself that I I didn't see it because it seems so obvious now. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that really, I think, was kind of where, why I started to, you know, try to look behind the curtains and see what was going on. Sure. And uh, Tommy, the other thing that I was actually listening to today, um, you brought up Pete earlier. Um, I was listening to your show with Pete on the fourth industrial revolution. And we could start mm -hmm. talking about this too. But um, you had told him that you read... Um, the fourth industrial revolution um, four times, like that book oh, four times. Oh my God. <laughs> Buoyancy. <laughs> Hello. What's up, Quincy? Hey, what's, what's going on? <laughs> I didn't realize we were going to have a guest appearance. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about Obama shit. What's up to you? So I'm happy 100th, man. Happy 100th, man. I had to come through making an appearance, man. Happy 100th. Here's to 100 more, man. Keep doing your thing. Oh, hell yeah, Quincy. Thanks, brother. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's hilarious. <laughs> take, take your beer, brother. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. I can't believe that. Yeah, we were, we were trying dude. to figure out a way to derail you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's not very hard at all it's not hard at all oh um, uh, it's your hundredth dude you gotta have a little bit of fun oh, we can yeah. talk serious right. now but you gotta yeah. have a little bit of fun oh no dude time. for sure yeah well we were already talking about drinking beforehand <laughs> but uh <laughs> back to the topic <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i can't believe fucking quincy that's awesome um so, he called me last week. He was like, hey, dude, I'm going to be in town. Can I come by? Can I come stay the night at your house? I was like, fuck yeah, dude. Come on by. Nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you read the fourth industrial revolution four times, right? Four times. Yeah. Yeah. Fourth revolution four times. <laughs> yep. Well, I actually have read it six times by now, but some, some of it's audio too. Like, like mm. it's not all me just sitting. I, I mean, I, I'm a truck driver, so. I have a lot of time on the road, so there was a lot of audio book involved in that. Yeah. But so, yes, I, I went through, I, I dug into that book because it creeped me out. Mm -hmm. So I guess kind of tapping onto there, the same question I posed to Courtney. 
Um, what kind of got you interested to start kind of asking the questions that you n weren't really hearing other people asking? Oliver Stone's JFK. Mm -hmm. Ah, that was great. Yeah. The first, the first, I was, I was like 12 years old when I saw that and I was like, wow, the CIA is crazy. I want to be a hitman for them. <laughs> and like, I mean, honestly, that was my first thought. Like, I want to be a hitman for the CIA. And That'd so, and, and so, yeah, it, it was, it was all through CIA and digging into, uh, Operation Gladio. I got legacy of ashes up there poisoner in chief like reading all that stuff man and just you just start following you know uh what was the one that was so good um confessions of an economic hitman and i think i think confessions of an economic hitman is the one that really opened my eyes to corporations and and their influence mm -hmm. and and really made me start looking in that direction Okay, so I the was CIA is like it's it's fascinating and horrifying <laughs> the more you dive into it. All at the and same I'm time. Particularly, I've always been really fascinated because they tried to recruit me when I was seven years old. So oh. I've always been oh, like, geez. I've always felt like, wow, my soul was really spared, but I really didn't know just how much. And the more I dive into it, I'm like, wow, yeah, I really feel very fortunate that I missed that. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's like a train wreck. You Once you start uncovering, you you just, you have to know everything because it's, yeah, it's kind of just like incredulous. It's hard to believe that they do some of the things that they do. Yeah, the, the amount that they did in such a short period of time too. Like just looking into like one one thing. If you just look, like if you just look into like, let's say MK Ultra just with the, mm -hmm. the limited amount of information that we have about what they did, it spans yeah. 20, 20 years and you can get multiple 600 page books out of it because it's just so incredible. Like the amount of stuff they were doing, um, with, with, uh, Cameron Ewan and, you know, in Canada and in, in France and then San Francisco and, and you're just, it's just this web of craziness. I remember there was, uh, I can't think of the guy's name off the top of my head, but they were talking to one guy and he was, they, they said they considered him the ultimate CIA, um, uh, officer, I guess would be the best way. I, I want to say asset, but maybe officer would be a better way of saying it. And he said, I get paid to to plunder kill steal and lie why would i want to do anything mm -hmm. else and it's like wow uh, that's Whoa. i mean that's how they saw their job well i mean what i've really come to conclude is that the cia is essentially like a military industrial complex front you know legitimized quote unquote front for the occult so it makes sense that, you know, somebody who has that worldview would see that as, you know, like the pinnacle of you know, why would they want to do anything else? Right. I mean, to them, that is right. the ultimate. Yeah. Yeah. So, but uh, that, that is really what I've kind of come to conclude. And, uh, and they, and they, they attract such, such interesting people. Like if you've ever read like the book ghost about James Jesus Angleton, like just such an interesting guy, you know, just mm -hmm. you, you, you start reading and he's like, he's a poet, you know, like that's, that's how he got his start. He was a poet in, in, in literature. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just, just the, the type of people that they had attracted were very well, I think interesting they, people. They, they recruit, you know, like they tried to recruit mm. me. So they recruit and then they, and they're recruiting for very specific things. And then they also attract because, because of the nature, like I said, that I do mm. think it is kind of a front for the occult. So you're kind of yeah. getting people who are coming through that, uh, lineage, if you will. And that's where they end up. Right. And the compartmentalization is, you know, is kind very of, kind of like, you know, these, well, like the ascension of a, you know, fraternity for, per se, you know, for mm -hmm. example, yeah. and essentially that is what a lot of, a lot of them, you know, like 
skull and bones, <laughs> you know, it's essentially mm, yeah. the overturned knee and they, they, they climb that ladder and end up in those. This yeah. is so, um, I've heard MK ultra thrown around a lot and I can't believe I don't know this and I never did some digging on it, but what, what's kind of the origin and the story behind that? Cause you guys have kind of laid out some of the bits and pieces from it and it sounds like it's a pretty deep dive, but I, I guess let's give kind of like a ground level view of what that is. So it means mind control. Uh, so mm. control K in German, right? Uh, mind, mind control, right? Sure. Um, but if it were, if it had been English, it would have been, uh, you know, MC Ultra, essentially. Mm -hmm. And it, they they did programs where they were mind control programs, and there were several variations of them. Uh, some were using uh, trauma based mind control. And some of them were using drugs. So, like, for instance, the LSD movement was a, a CIA PSYOP. They uh, essentially worked through Timothy Leary and the Grateful Dead to popularize LSD to do experiments mm -hmm. on, uh, you know, the use of drugs and mind control. LSD wasn't the only one, but that's one of the very popular kind of examples. But they, it's essentially mind control through many different mechanisms but you know the most common are either trauma-based mind control or uh drugs drug-induced mind control wow and, and this kind of goes to what i talk about a lot on here is that you need some kind of cultural force behind a lot of these movements in order to get them off the ground to keep them moving it's not it's usually not a top-down kind of thing so when you have something like once again the lsd movement with the grateful dead then you know they're very cultural band i mean you still see to this day people you know, the walls of certain stores lined with grateful dead merch well, why is that mm -hmm. right yeah yeah yeah, yeah, well, I mean, I mean, that's it. One of the other things. <laughs> one of the other things I've really come to realize is that, like, you know, culture really doesn't just, it's very rare that culture just occurs on its own. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, culture really is, it's created and it's mostly created by the Tavistock Institute, which works through the CIA. So, yeah. Wow. I've been, I've been working, I've been working through this idea actually that kind of like goes into this and, uh, I'm, I'm kind of testing it and, and, and feeling it out and seeing, seeing if it, if it actually holds muster. But what, what I'm, what I'm concluding is like, we've all heard the, the, the line that politics is downstream from culture and That's I have a, a tenant, right. And, and, and I'm starting to look at culture and find that culture seems to be downstream from money. And, uh, and so it, it ties the whole money and politics together. You have to control the culture through money fi fiscally in order to move the politics in the direction you want them to move. Well, I think the, I'm sorry, go on. Yeah. No, no, you're fine. Uh, Go ahead. I was going to say, I, I mean, I to some extent, I agree with you. I mean, I, the money is a tool, but I actually don't think that money is the driver. I, I like I said, I actually think it is these forces. Uh, you know, it's done through these like think tanks and government uh, collusion, essentially. Uh, so, mm -hmm. like I mentioned, Tavistock. You know, they do all of these uh, social science experiments on people. And then they, mm -hmm. uh, that is, that research is then essentially weaponized in order to socially engineer the masses. And they do that through, uh, they have these covert ops where they're doing all of these experiments to, uh, do testing grounds, essentially create these social science test tubes. And it is through the, these different you know, various think tanks and through, through CIA as well. And CIA is like a master of psyops and they create this culture. So yeah, money is a tool, but I, I don't think that the money drives the culture actually at all. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can see it even with these really big, uh, you know, like, like BlackRock right now, right? BlackRock's not driving the culture because they have money. 
uh, these NGOs have created these ESG scores and BlackRock wants to rule the world as so far as they can. And so they're, you know, leading the way in these ESGs uh, because they're tied to the World Economic Forum, because they're tied to, uh, you know, the WHO and uh, these other various NGOs. So through that, they're, of course, having a huge impact on the culture, but that it's as a tool. Well, it's not I, the money itself. Yeah, so Tommy's talked about um, this idea surrounding how, like, a lot of people in libertarian circles all read the same literature, and he extrapolates that to the elites. Do, do that kind of approximate your idea there correctly? Yeah, kind of. Like, what I'm saying is, I'm not, I'm not, what I'm, what I'm trying to do is, is give people um, a defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. um against the 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 terms like conspiracy theory mm -hmm. and so what i'm saying is that if you have an ideology that the, the people from that ideology are all reading the same literature they're all connected to the same mimetic view of the world uh kind of their their ideals are the same their, their goals are very similar. And so in order to, to package these things that are happening, like whether you take the Great Reset, you take ESG, you take New World Order, you take these things. What I'm, I'm, I'm really saying all the you New can World Order, pull. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I, I'm just saying when you look at yeah. it the way that it's like put out there, like sure. when you, when you look at it, you, you can pull the nefarious nature out of it and you can say, okay, like, I know that, you know, Carol Quigley wrote about this. I know that Charles Galton Darwin wrote about this. I know that HG Wells wrote about this. I know all these things. Like I, I get mm -hmm. it, but how do I talk to a normie? Like, how do I talk to the average per person and, and attract them in, in open their eyes to what's going on? So let's yeah. take the out of it because conspiracies do take a lot of concentration, study, and research, and to understand what what's going on. Even as much time as I spend on it, a lot of them I'm still kind of like scratching my head, going, "What are y'all doing? Like this makes no sense." You know, like <laughs> if you if you talk to me about eugenics, right? I still look at I'm like, "What what is this? This is the most inhuman thing ever." And so it. it for somebody who doesn't dive deep into it, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to boil it down to the nuts and bolts, make it very easy to comprehend and to access mm -hmm. and somebody that doesn't have hours to put into it. So what I'm saying is that if all libertarians read Rothbard and they all kind of have the same view of what an ideal society would look like, they all kind of preach the same message. What's to make you think that elites aren't in the same boat, that they're not all reading the same information, that they don't all have very similar goals and they're all traveling a specific path to reach a certain ends. And all their movements yeah. are, are moving us to, towards those ends that you don't, that you can take the nefarious and the, the, in the conspiracy portion out of it and just say that it's where they're getting their information from that is pushing them in this direction. Right. And, and uh, I always like that idea because it, it does make sense, at least to me. Um, <clears throat> and when you look at what they're doing, so like I was looking up stuff about BlackRock and You're Vanguard. Uh oh, of you course. Again. Of course. There he goes. Right when we're recording, of course, it cuts out. Um, yeah. But um, I was looking up stuff about BlackRock and Vanguard today. And when you start looking at like a lot of these companies that have a lot of influence, they're typically owned by about the same like nine companies over and over and over and over again. And you could see that BlackRock over the last, you know, couple of years has increasingly owned more and more shares of like every single company. So you see that they're all kind of have, they all have the same strategy, right? And they're all different people running them. But once again, kind of going back to what you were saying is that they have kind of these same means and the same ideas to get to their ends that they want to get to. Um, so I, I know that's a 
a little bit of a tangent there, Courtney, but uh, you seem like you're chomping at the bit, so I want to give you uh, an opportunity yeah. as well. Yeah, so, well, well, there's a lot to say in there, and there's a lot to unpack in there. So, yeah, BlackRock, uh, I mean, that's a whole, we could spend, like, the two hours on BlackRock itself. <laughs> um, but, yeah, BlackRock owns, like, the majority of the, uh, pretty much everything, and the Vanguard is the largest shareholder of BlackRock. Uh, and then when you go and look through Vanguard, uh, who the ownership of Vanguard is, it's mostly the office families, so like the 13 families. State Street seems to be the number three, and State Street is a large uh, shareholder of both uh, BlackRock and uh, Vanguard. But BlackRock, when you're, sorry, when you're talking about, uh, I'll take segue from that for, for a minute, but when you're talking about like them just reading the same materials, I... I don't know if I, I, I'm not sure if maybe I'm just misunderstanding you, but it, it has more to do with a worldview. It's not just that they're reading the same material. So I, it's very different when the layman and, you know, the masses, like if you and I are curious, I'll just use myself as an example. I don't want to speak for you, but you know, mm -hmm. when I'm curious about something, I, I start going down the rabbit hole. So I will, you know, start researching and trying to figure out what, you know, I have a question, how do I get from here? And then all of a sudden I'll find this, this other, and then I end up with, you know, books and, you know, white papers mm. and, and I, I do this research. So yes, I get the people who share ideology. I'm not necessarily in, you know, a camp like that. So a little bit more of, I just do research. Uh, but I understand people who maybe, let's say, of a libertarian, and then they all, you know, kind of read similar books and they converse back and forth. Um, but what's going on with these elites is, I think, different because, yes, they share materials, obviously. You know, that's a part of what these meetings like Davos is, and uh, they have these big, you know, conglomerate kind of uh, uh, conventions uh, each year, but they all also share, there is a, a teleological end. They have, a, but it comes from a worldview. Like when you're talking about mm -hmm. eugenics and you say how you just can't wrap your head around it, it's because it is truly a demonic worldview. That, that's mm -hmm. where this stems from. And they oh, think that, yeah, they, yeah that's why I can't wrap God. my head around it. It makes no sense to me. It's yeah, like, I mean, why would anybody sure, do I this? That. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, that's, but that is where this comes from. So it, I think it has less to do with the, they read certain books, you know, I don't really. Okay, maybe I, is. maybe I'm explaining what, what my purpose in covering it that way is because I have mm -hmm. a purpose in, in covering it the way I'm covering it. It's not right. because that's all I think there is to it. What mm -hmm. I'm trying to show people is, is like, look, again, I'm, I'm trying to talk to people who don't dig into this stuff. Right. Like, no, I get you're that. not, you're not my target audience. Like my right, target right. audience is, is Joe Bob down the, down the road. Who's digs ditches for a living. You know, like <laughs> right, I want right. to talk to the normal guy who's going to go right. out and vote. And so I'm mm -hmm. trying to figure out how do I package this information in such a way that Joe Bob gets it. And so yeah. what I'll, what I'm trying to do is say, okay, let's forget this. Let's, let's ignore right. that. Let's ignore this conspiracy in Davos and Bilderberg and this, what's this new thing they got the world government organization that meets in Dubai and let's ignore those things. Let's, Talk about the ideas, the ideology, the technocrats and how they view the world and how do they get to this worldview. And what I'm saying is that they live, not only read the same books, but they're, they're going to the, they're studying the same at the same colleges. They're communicating with the same people. Like there's all these interactions, this whole network, as John Robb calls it, is, is intermingling and creating this kind of hive mind amongst themselves that mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be the technical conspiracy that everybody wants to believe that it could be, be like a hundred people aimed in the same direction, moving in the same way in parallel to each other. And let's just accept the fact that when you have 30 construction workers working on a house, they're all aimed at the same end goal. And it's well, that is simple. literally the definition of conspiracy, though. <laughs> so, right, like right. Said, but what I'm trying to, what right? 
Right. What I'm trying to do is pull that weaponization out of it and try to make it mm -hmm. more easier for uh, the average person to accept right. and digest I, and I understand. I think though, what I, I, and I really appreciate that. And I understand what you're saying. And I, I, I appreciate what you're trying to do, but I think we have to be really careful about not playing into their paradigm and not accepting their premises, you know, like to feel the need to de-weaponize. Uh, I, I don't think we have to play into the idea that conspiracy is anything other than what conspiracy literally means and <clears throat> conspiracies absolutely exist and mm -hmm. a conspiracy theory is very different than a true conspiracy that there is evidence to support there is a right. that a conspiracy has occurred and moreover right. conspiracy theories are not a bad thing because there is no way when you're when you're under mm. uncovering a crime scene you don't know everything that happened, right? You start connecting mm. dots. You have to put forth theories, and then you test them, and then you go question the suspects, right? That, that's how that works. It's an investigation. Mm. That's why it's called an investigation. But if nobody can make a theory and nobody can theorize about anything and nobody can connect dots, then you're not going to find the answers. So it's not this dirty word. And I, I guess I'm just really uh, cognizant of falling into that trap because I think you know, what did Orwell say? The revolution will be complete when the language is perfected. And they're mm. constantly weaponizing and distorting and inverting language. So, yeah. yeah. And I'm I just don't know. Um, I don't know another way to get somebody mm -hmm. from um, Sean Hannity to, to <laughs> Jay Dyer. I, I, I just can't think of another way to get him there. Because <laughs> like, so when I, the first time I ever heard Jay Dyer, I was like, what the hell is this guy going on about? Like, I don't know what this guy's talking about. And it took me a lot of time of working my way up to Jay Dyer and, and, oh, yeah. and hearing him bring up a subject and I'd have to go mm -hmm. look up that subject on my own. So I'm like, yeah. who, he, who's he was that? Here yesterday. He's like, a, I noticed you have a lot of the same books. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, there's, but there's, a, there's a missing link. And I think I'm trying to meet that, 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 kind of idea of the missing link from I think, Sean Hannity to Jay Dyer or from right. Glenn Beck to Jay Dyer. Like, how do sure. you get somebody there? Well, I think, um, I mean, Jay does fantastic work. He's been on my podcast right. a few times. We're about to I'm just using one. him as an he, example. Like, yeah. And he's, he's fantastic. <laughs> but the thing about Jay and it, you know, what he does really well is he, he goes through the text, right? So mm -hmm. he's, but it's a very, uh, it, he comes from a very intellectual perspective. He's analyzing mm -hmm. these white papers and these books. The difference is like John Hannity and, uh, you know, even Glenn Beck, but they're, they're coming from more of like a propagandized news kind of angle. They're, mm. they're not reading right. text. They're, they're telling you a, not even the news, what happened. It's they're reporting on the news. I'll, I'll keep Glenn Beck out of it for a second because Glenn Beck is slightly different. Um, but, you know, Sean Hannity, he's not reporting on, you know, written works. He's mm -hmm. giving you a commentary on news that may or may not have happened, <laughs> to, to be yeah. really honest. You know, he's giving you right. a commentary right. on news that's been funneled down to him. So when you say, like, how do you take somebody from, uh, you know, Sean Hannity, well, again, we'll take Glenn Beck out of the picture just for a second because I do think Glenn Beck is slightly different. Um, but to like a Jay Dyer, I I think it's more a matter of how do you take somebody to uh, the material, which is why I constantly try to encourage people to read more. But this is really the problem. The problem is most people today do not read. Very few people are even capable of reading. And I don't mean that they don't have the intellectual capacity, because I'm talking about some very, very intelligent people who I will send materials to. And they literally tell me, you know, uh, TLDR, too long, didn't read. They can't even type out too long, didn't read, you know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, I'm like, wow. But That's these the people... first time I've ever known what tldr stood for you never do I've that seen it, i know i've seen it so many times and i'm just like yeah. 
I don't know what these people are talking about. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, it, like, and, and it's great that Jay does that work because so many people, do, and I've told him this, I'm like, it's fantastic because so many people do not read and you break yeah. this down for them. And so, you know, they don't have to, and, and to be fair, a lot of people don't have the time, you know, that that's true too. Yeah. Uh, there are people living their lives and trying to feed their families and that sort of thing. And, you know, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, shame anybody for, but there are people who really can. And just, we're, it's a cultural thing that people just don't. And the education system has dumbed people down so much that a lot of them don't have the reading comprehension skills, you know, required to be able to ascertain, you know, the material uh, inside some of these works. So right. I, it's great that he's doing that. But it's very, very different. So we're talking about, like, how do you take somebody from listening to somebody's opinion on something <laughs> and then listening to, you know, really a, an analysis of, uh, you know, these uh, either, uh, you know, really instrumental books or uh, white papers. And that is a big leap. But that's what I try to do in that, in that respect is, you know, certainly point them towards, like, hey, you can watch some of these videos. Um, but also to just drop the seeds. So I had a conversation pretty recently and I felt really bad because again, it's really hard to take somebody who is, you know, a complete normie and, uh, who has some kind of awareness, right. And a very intelligent person, but he didn't know what a white paper was mm. and right. And I, mm. I, which was kind of just shocking to me. How does somebody not know what a white paper is? And right. so it's like, how can they possibly believe what I'm saying? I just sound like a crazy person. Forget conspiracy theorists. I just sound crazy. You know, like, yeah. what is she talking about? Like, this isn't real. This isn't possible. But yeah. I will send the documents. I will send, like, you know, the clips on it and show them, look, this is real. You can do a search. You have to work a little harder. It's not going to come up on the first page of Google. In fact, what will come up on the first page of Google might be the fact check saying like, this is not true or this doesn't exist. You may have to go to the right. third, fourth page or maybe go to a different search engine, but it's all there and it's all there in plain sight. You know, it's hidden in plain sight. Yeah. So Yeah. It's just, it's just my goal. Like I said, my goal is to talk. Like, I deal, I, I work blue collar. I always have. And mm -hmm. I, these are the people I talk to. Like most of the people I talk to sound like Marjorie Taylor Greene. Like, mm -hmm. honestly. Yeah. I mean, that, that's she gets like, it. That, that's my, the average she conversation gets it, I have. Right? She gets some it. Some of it, some of it, like there's still some things she says and I'm like, what, what are you, what are you saying? Like this, doesn't, no, you're not, that doesn't make sense. You can't No, <laughs> but but no, but they, they kind of have that kind of understanding of politics kind of the same way she does. Like, I'll just, they get voted in, they make changes. And it's like, no, that's not the way this works. <laughs> and so th this is who I deal with on a daily basis. And so mm -hmm. that's kind of who I target my podcast around. It's right. like, these are the people I know. I live sure. in rural Texas. Like it's, you know, I, I'm on nine acres. I work at a little lumber yard you know, and mm -hmm. drive a truck for them. And so it's, it's those interactions. Like if, if somebody like brings up politics at work, I don't like chime in with my opinions the, so, I'll hear something they say and I'll just be like, you know what? You might like to read this book and I'll give them a book to read. Yeah. And then they'll I, read I think... it because I relate it to what they're already concerned with. Like I yes. just, a, a buddy of mine just bought the creature from Jekyll Island the other day. Like, just because he was like, what are these people doing? How did, did you know that the federal reserve worked like this? And I was like, yeah, dude, have you read this book? And he's like, no, I was like, dude, you got to read it. It reads like a mystery yeah, novel. They literally you love it. Conspiracy. They literally had a yeah. secret meeting on Jekyll Island. Yeah. <laughs> right. But, but I didn't even, conspiracy. but I didn't even have to tell him it. I didn't have to tell him any of that. All I had to do is like, dude, you got to read this book. I didn't know you were interested in that. You got to check out this book. It reads like a mystery novel. And he was like, great and he ordered it the next day you know and i'm like all right cool my job here is done you know and i go on about my business and so like whenever i'm trying to package whenever i'm whenever i'm saying things these ways like like what kyle's expressing i'm yeah. trying to package these ideas in a way that an average person will see it and go well that's crazy let me look at that mm -hmm. 
where it doesn't sound like, yeah, there's all these Bond villains sitting around a table going, you know, it and kind of are. <laughs> yeah, kind of, but it's still, <laughs> you know, you know, if I brought up, if I, if I, if I brought up the word Davos to somebody in a daily conversation, they wouldn't know what I was talking about. But if I say, Hey man, I read this really crazy book where they're talking about population control. Can you believe people think about this? Like, they're like, wait, what? That's wild. Yeah. Why would they think about that? And you can have that conversation in that way. And so that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to meet them where they're at. Right. And trying no, to bring that conversation great. to them. And I'm, so, I mean, so as, as you say, I read the books so right. I can dumb it down to a blue collar level. Yeah, no. And we definitely need that. <laughs> um, and I was going to suggest that that it sounds like exactly what you are doing is that people will, their interest is peaked when it's relevant to them. So, mm. you know, it, it, whatever is concerning them, and there is so much, they want to control every aspect of everyone's lives. So there is going mm. to be something that is affecting someone, right? So whenever they bring right, up the right. thing that's affecting them and they're most concerned with, I think that's when you can point them in, in the direction, which just sounds like you're doing. That's awesome. Yeah. It, well, this yeah, but I'm definitely, I'm definitely not going down the libertarian road and going, you should read Mises and not Marx. <laughs> Read Mises yeah. and not Marx. No, read both. Enjoy. Well, I mean, both of them. I, I don't think find the libertarian and both. The libertarian approach is definitely not going to combat the globalists um, because the libertarian <laughs> is, it's, the, it's the path to globalism essentially, which is you know I think a lot of people don't realize that, but you know philosophically mm. speaking, it is it's it's the gateway for globalism. So. I, it's very appealing, and I, I understand why a lot of people who, uh, you know, they think that they're anti-globalist, but they tend to pick that because they think it's, you know, individualism. But when you really study classic, the you study the economic classical. principles. I was just going to say, I was just going to like a small comment on that. Is this classical liberalism has always been totalitarian, and there's there's no yeah. other way to look at it. It's totally. evangelical. It, it, it takes uh, its principles and its its style away from the ev mm -hmm. evangelical Christians, and yeah. it believes in spreading the word that way. And if that doesn't work, then we'll use brute force. But if you read, like I said, brought up earlier, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, it tells you straight up how they operate. Mm -hmm. They come in, they try to whine and dine you, they try to convince you, they try to you know flirt with you, make you feel all special. <laughs> and if that yeah. doesn't work, they send in the jackals, you know. <laughs> We don't have time to jack with you anymore. We're just going to send mm -hmm. in the big guns. So, like, yeah, there's definitely a way they do it. And I, I, I can see what you're saying about libertarianism. I don't look at libertarianism that way. And maybe it's because of what I've read in the way I read it. Maybe that's what it is. The way I comprehend it. Like, when I look at, when I read, like, Hoppe or Rothbard, mm -hmm. they're not talking about atomization. They're not talking about individuality. They're not mm -hmm. talking about individualism. They're talking about how do you create liberty? And so they bring right, up but... like, 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 uh, Hoppe is famous for his 10,000 Lichtensteins. Like mm -hmm. they're talking about these different ways. And so there I'm, is, I'm really referring there, more to there is definitely, well, I was going to say, I was going to like give you, there is a vein of libertarianism that is super individualistic. And that typically mm -hmm. comes out of people that are less well read on the subjects well that, uh, that that's actually wasn't where, where i was from. going with it I, I was really referring more to the economic principles i mean if you're talking about a true open free market uh then there are no borders right so it's essentially uh the that that's a pathway for a global market so it well i, I, mean, I was really referring more you, to i mean the, you can look uh, at it that way I, well, I guess yeah, I mean that is essentially that what it does because you you don't have well, any that, I mean any... well it depends again this is this is all in the reading of it I've I've gotten in these okay. arguments with libertarians 5000 times over this <laughs> because like I look at a place like Tehran that kicked out all politicians and all the cartel and formed their own community and are mm -hmm. are self sufficient and operating outside the government of Mexico mm -hmm. and I'm like yeah, that's libertarian. And people are like, no, that's communist. And I'm like, what, what are you talking about? 
That's not communist. That's libertarian. These people like have gotten rid of the rulers. They've, they've organized themselves. They've Mm -hmm. kind of figured out their own like pathway. And so it really does come down to how somebody interprets these, these writings and these readings. And Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I guess there are a lot of people that view it the way that you're saying, but then there's kind of like my, I guess, market anarchist kind of ideas that, you know, has read Roderick Long, Rothbard, Mises, and all these other guys, Sheldon Richmond, and, and kind of taken all these ideas from the school of thought and, and been like, oh, okay, I kind of get like the whole picture here that, that they are trying to draw. Um, but yeah, you you are correct in the way that like a Milton Friedman you know, a Friedmanite would definitely interpret things. I just think a Misesian view is a little bit more nuanced that, and maybe, maybe it's a little, it's, it's so nuanced that some people miss it. Von Misses, I wouldn't really uh, call him like a strict uh, libertarian. I mean, he's definitely more Austrian school of economics. And I I do think there are some differences. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't put him in quite the same category, actually. Well, the, I mean, the, he, he was oh, the fan uh, and of. See, and I apologize, then because when you say mm-hmm. libertarian, I think of Mises and Rothbard. Mm-hmm. Like that's where mm-hmm. my mind, because that's the school of thought I come from. Right. Uh, but it, yeah, if you go like Chicago school, Friedmanite, kind of the Reaganite, trickle down mm-hmm. economics types, mm-hmm. you're absolutely right. Like, absolutely, yeah. I I have no qualms with the way you describe it. <laughs> I'll, yeah. let the, I'll let the Freemanites argue with you. I'm not going to go into it. <laughs> I, the border debate's kind of a, a hot topic within libertarian circles, but uh, I always kind of reflect it back to private property rights where you have private borders, where um, kind of like you were talking about the uh, private town. Um, I, I can't remember the name of it, but they basically enforce. Right, Tehran, or whatever however the hell you say it. Um, Tehran. For- it, it's C H C H E A E R A N. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But they enforce their private property rights and don't allow other people coming in. And this kind of gets into something that you had talked about on Pete's show as well. And I think, Courtney, you probably know about some of this as well. Um, do, you, do you have anything to add there, Courtney, before I uh, kind of take us down another rabbit hole? No, no. Go, go. Okay. Um, <laughs> when, when you have um, a town like that that has a very, very strict cultural respect for private property rights, then um, – you don't have these 501c3s like you were mentioning coming in and purchasing um, stock in the school or putting people on the board or special appointees to certain places to change the culture of that town, right? Because that kind of seems like what you were saying they were doing, if I remember correctly. They were, all right. So what happened was, it's kind of funny. Um, it's ultra feminist really because the women chase the narcs and the the, the, i mean the cartel and the feds out Mm -hmm. Uh, like literally the women did the men didn't do it the women chased them out with like brooms and shovels and pick pickaxes and shit Uh, it was like get out of here we're tired of y'all's bullshit because they were bringing in all the corruption um the only thing i would say about borders here, here here's here's borders are the are only relevant if you're willing to defend them. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, yeah, otherwise it's not a border. When, when you have, <laughs> right. Right. When you have like a, well, well, my buddy LB Mooney's when he was on my show last time, he, he made a comment and he said, um, America's borders are being shown by what they're willing to defend. And it's not Mexico. And he's talking about Ukraine, the Ukrainian borders, that that's America's mm-hmm. borders now. Like Mexico is not America's borders. Like no matter what they tell us, like that's just not it. That's not reality. All right. Well, yeah. So, our deep state so is it, in Ukraine. So. Right. <laughs> right. Um, when, whenever it comes to, when it comes to securing borders, yes, private property does have a lot to do with it, but you're not going to individually, you're not going to be able to secure your borders privately against um, a state. And we saw this with like Moorsnet, right? So Moorsnet was an anarchist society that existed for a hundred years. And what happened to Moorsnet was it was an undisputed territory and it turned into a mining town. 
and they just kind of did their own thing. They didn't have a government. They didn't, they just did whatever. And that was just kind of, they, they organized themselves culturally the way that they wanted to organize. They, they did things the way they did things. And that was that. And then the two countries, and I can't remember the two European countries that bordered Moore's net, forgive me, but they, they decided to dispute over this territory because this mining town was bringing in a lot of money. So a government came in and destroyed this, um, town that had been existent for a hundred years without governance. And it did so with military power. And now you have to get special permissions and special passport exemptions to go into Moore's net. Right? So the, the thing is that you not only you have to have borders that you're willing to defend, which Moore's net was not willing to defend. They didn't, they didn't defend anything. They were just like, we're a mining town. We're just doing our thing. We're not bothering anybody. Nobody's going to bother us. Right. They kind of had the live and let live strategy. And that's not the way the world works. So you do have to like with, without organization on some larger scale, then you can't, you're not going to be able to secure your private property borders. So what would be like, let's say, let's just say the area I live in, right? It's a, it's an area of 2000 people. It's a town of 2000 people and everybody owns their own property. All right. We would have to be able be willing to defend our neighbor's borders as well. Not just our own. We'd have to be, be willing to come together as a militia and defend each other's borders from outside sources. But with with what, what Courtney was describing with kind of the Friedmanite kind of view, which is very atomistic, um, in, in its ideals, that's not the way they look at it, which where if you look at like Hoppe, like I said, he talks about 10,000 Lichtensteins, right? Mm -hmm. They're talking about creating these communities, these trusted voluntarist societies in which you operate together. The agorist talk about this. Like if you read Konkin, mm -hmm. He talks about this a lot, right? So there is this school of thought that that libertarianism isn't it it's it's a there there are individual rights that must be protected, but they must be protected by a voluntarist group that comes together as a collective, right? And this is very hard for people to understand. This is why I don't like I don't disagree with like syndicalists very often. Because we actually are very similar on the way we view the world. I view the world very much from an extended family point of view. And um, so, so I want the grandparents and the uncles and the aunts all to be involved. And I think that's the best way to organize society is to get back into these. Oh, yeah. Really well, large that's why they've done everything units. to try and divide the family. They, they right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So th this is where I think we all agree. And I think this might be perhaps Courtney where you might have had a misunderstanding for perhaps at least my kind of libertarianism because I mm -hmm. always preach for tight-knit communities and being very very mm -hmm. close with your neighbor and being close with your family as much as possible because mm -hmm. like you were saying when you start to destroy that then things can easily go astray and it's easy mm -hmm. to corrupt you know closer units that are closer to your immediate um collective right it's not just mm -hmm. in my mind where i think libertarianism i think of you know personal responsibility to the highest degree and then mm -hmm. also i take that a step further and i call myself a socially conservative person where once again you need to have very strong family values and very strong community values whether that be through a church or some other ethic that people have just that they mutually share in this given community to, you know, raise a culture of respect for property rights and the kind of libertarianism I see. I'm not the, you know, libertine individualism of just, you know, go smoke weed and do ayahuasca in the woods. And uh, I definitely you know. think that I definitely think that was a, 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 a psyop that that penetrated the libertarian thought though. Right. Because if you look at like, if you look at the writings of the early libertarians, like a David Nolan or, or Rothbard or, or these guys, they were actually very conservative in their own lives and mm -hmm. they were not libertine in, in the way that they expressed themselves. Right. Even, even Rothbard, who was not religious, considered himself an atheist, was very, very conservative. Mm -hmm. And he only, he, he actually, especially later in his life in the 90s, which you hear a lot about 90s Rothbard if you listen to Buck Johnson, 
Yeah. Um, so I had to throw that out there. Uh, but, <laughs> so, but, uh, yeah, he was, he was, he was much closer to the Buchananite, the paleo conservative kind of, uh, thought. Mm -hmm. And so, so, but yeah, I definitely think there was, was definitely some psyops that went on and there were people that were infiltrating this ideology to make it more individual because if you can separate you can divide these people then it's right. easier to control well, there them. are it's rumors that uh ann rand did uh, date a rothschild so <laughs> and it's... i wouldn't doubt it i don't consider her libertarian though like, objectivism yeah. is not yeah. libertarianism <laughs> yeah i mean I, I think a lot of people do look to her as kind of a you know mm -hmm. a leader of the libertarian kind of school of thought but I, I I would really call her an objectivist. I mean, yeah. to me, that uh, she kind of didn't but... she kind of create objectivism, like mm -hmm. um, yeah, like pretty much. And I've yeah. always said objectivism is not libertarianism. If you've ever talked to these people for ten minutes, you're like, what? you don't want liberty. <laughs> well, that, that's kind of like um, a lot of people kind of tie Austrian economics and libertarianism together, although they are the, completely separate. They're but separate, th but. Typically, most libertarians believe in Austrian economics, and the libertarians that don't believe in Austrian economics are usually pretty bad libertarians. They're usually more so the libertine libertarians. That's, the that's, same guys. that's where I went wrong earlier because that's mm -hmm. what I thought she was talking about. So that was that was mm -hmm. uh, yeah. okay. Wow. I'm, I'm talking specifically Austrian yeah. economics, and she's like, and I'm like, wait, no, wait, hold on. <laughs> 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 but it's yeah, all good i know that's why we're, we're, we're figuring each other out here we're, we're getting it yeah. we're getting it <laughs> yeah 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 um so, uh, why yeah yeah we went down quite this, a few rabbit holes this, yeah this this conversation completely went in a total <laughs> different direction than we thought it was no that's cool yeah. <laughs> so the wef yeah <laughs> yeah so wef <laughs> i um i literally sent us in the group chat the uh, video of klaus schwab talking at the world economic forum because they were literally meeting in davos today um yeah so i, I guess let's give a ground I level it. you did okay yeah so i, 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 I started did. watching it i was 30 seconds into it when you jumped on the video <laughs> Quincy's here, man. What do you want me to do? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so well, I guess let's kind of start here and we can extrapolate out here for the listeners. Um, what is the World Economic Forum and why should we be concerned about it? Um, and either one, you could take that. Go ahead, Courtney. I've been talking a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I do that. I apologize. I talk a lot. No, That's why no, I have a podcast. I agree. Um, so what is the World Economic Forum? And what was the other part of the question? Why should we be concerned about it? Oh, <laughs> so I guess the World Economic Forum was uh, started by uh, Klaus Schwab, but it was really under uh, Henry Chris Kissinger and uh, Herman Kahn. And uh, who was the other one? They, they recruited Klaus uh, back in 1971. And it was a, a European council initially. And uh, I don't know how much you know about Kissinger, um, but yeah, that's probably a whole long rabbit hole. But um, yeah, so he kind of, they've recruited and it was under like a, you know, CIA funded Harvard program that uh, Klaus was in that they recruited him from. And uh, so, yeah, so they've been having these meetings yearly at Davos, and it's kind of like this uh, very elite kind of country club. I don't know. This is, this is the Cliff Notes, obviously. Um, but you have to pay like a country club kind of fee to be a member. And uh, these people meet and have discussions about the future of uh all of the things that are affecting us. So the future of technology, the future of uh, medicine, the future of uh, really how they think we should run our day-to-day -day lives. And we should be concerned about it because first and foremost, they want the obliteration of nation states and sovereignty. And they want to ultimately usher in a new world order, which is a, a global uh, ruling of everything you know our monetary system our uh, medical system our, our religious system everything and they ultimately want to usher in a transhuman uh ai feudalistic takeover we're all living in uh you know a high borg mind 
So it's pretty scary. They should, they have way too, too much power and they're continuing to usurp more power. And this recent meeting with the pandemic treaty uh, was very convenient right after the outbreak of monkey monkeypox. And, you know, they did the open philanthropy document the way they war gamed uh, monkeypox last year. And they told us when they're going to have their outbreaks. It was literally the exact day, May 15th. And then they have our outbreak this year, May 15th. And now they're having these, this pandemic treaty meeting, uh, which does strip the United States of having any kind of sovereignty in those matters. Yeah. When, when I, I have a question for you, Courtney, because mm -hmm. one of the people I've been reading on here recently, and I've been reading his writings is, uh, I say recently, probably for the last year, I've kind of been flirting with, you know, his essays and, and the stuff he writes. And I just recently mm -hmm. bought like three of his books is, uh, Parag Khanna. Mm -hmm. And uh -huh. so he, uh, I don't, have you read any of his stuff? No. Okay. So he's mm -hmm. got this, um, he's got this theory It's called connectography, right? So it's connection and geography, okay. um, all put together as one, as one word. And what he's saying is that in the 20th century armies were, um, were were put together to guard borders but in the 21st century we're looking at a society in which armies are put together to guard supply chains okay and so he's like if you take away the borders of all nations and you look at the entire globe as a skeleton and the infrastructure are it, it are the bones of that skeleton and the communications networks are the, uh, the, uh, what do you call it? Not neurotransmitter, uh, the, uh, the nervous system. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> then, mm -hmm. um, then you have a view of how the world operates in the 21st century in that people that view the world in nation states are, are basically barbaric, right? And that it is the job of the governments to continue to fool the citizenry into believing in the nation state so that those uh, with a higher calling, those of the WEF, the oligarchs of the world, may construct the skeleton in the correct form so that it operates as a single uh, unit. Wow. And yeah, I'm not uh, familiar. He was one of the uh, young global leaders of the WEF. Okay. And he's he's actually given a lot of speeches there. Uh, he's given several TED Talks. Uh, I think I've listened to three of his TED Talks from okay. like 2010, 2016. I'll have to check his. Yeah, yeah no. I, I, I would definitely, I would definitely suggest you look into it because a lot of people focus a lot on Yuval Noah Harari, which is, he's a horrible, evil human being. Totally. But, um, but I think Parag Khanna is kind of the Zbigniew Brzezinski of the WEF. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Like and... when I'm reading, I'm reading connectography and all I see is a 21st century, um, grand chessboard. Wow. Yeah. I'll definitely check them out. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm not familiar, but that's, that sounds pretty horrifying. Um, yeah. <laughs> he wrote this insane essay called, uh, it's called dismantling empire through devolution in which he says with the Brexit movements and with Trump and these decentralized movements, what we're, what we have to realize is that we have to allow these people to have their culture while we control the business and the politics locally. Well, interesting. I mean, they, they've created the culture, so it's not letting them have their culture. Well, I don't know. Like if you look and at the like the area, is... if you look at the area I live in, they didn't create these, these rednecks. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but that's not, that's right. So, but that's, but that's not, the but that's what I'm, that's what I'm fine. saying. Like the, the, he's no, he's saying de a decentralized culture. He's saying, He's saying we're going to allow them to decentralize, to to create movements like Brexit oh, and break away 
and devolve the system from a centralized oh. government so that we can re-centralize under an oligarchy, a world oligarchy. Oh, uh, so I basically they create chaos so that they can swoop in with their master solution. Which yeah, is what, he, what he's saying is let the citizens, the local citizens believe they have control of their, of, of their community because mm -hmm. they are constructing the culture while we're buying the politicians and all the businesses. Which sounds like exactly what what is happening. That's that's interesting. I'll have to check out his work. I'm just not familiar, but no, that's fine. I'll send. Sounds I'll very send you important. Some of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I found out through I uh, found out about him through Patrick Wood's book, uh, Technocracy. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, Patrick Wood's great. Yeah, yeah. I, so I, I was read reading his book yet, but I, I read his book Technocracy: The Long Hard Road to uh, World Order, and he mentions Parag Khanna in the book. And that's what got me looking at the guy. Cause I was like, who is this guy? I've never heard of him before. So I yeah. just, that, that's how I find things. I've, I target in on one thing and I just start, what is this? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's how the rabbit hole starts. Right. It, it's, yeah. It's so odd to me that you don't see or hear from these people kind of like every day, right? Like everybody knows who the president is, right? Everybody knows who like their governor is, especially after 2020. But when you talk about these kind of global elites, the people who run the World Economic Forum or Vanguard or anything like that, it, these people are more so, like they're not, I don't want to say hot, hidden in plain sight, but they're there, but you don't quite hear about them as much. So like you guys are even talking about, you know, people that you don't necessarily know. Like if I go up to the average person, ask them who you all Harari or yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I, that's, that's such a weird name. But I guarantee you if I ask any of my coworkers who that is, they would look at me like I got six heads. Um, but these people really pull the strings on a lot of different things. But once again, you never hear about them. Well, and, that, and this is one of the things I, I said on Dave versus Goliath uh, when I was on the show the other day was he was asking about Klaus Schwab. And I was like, look, dude, he's a figurehead. No one yeah, believes. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Yeah. No one, no one believes Joe Biden is actually the president. Right. Like right. Klaus Schwab is just there. Uh, it, to, well, as I said, to look like a Bond villain. You're literally recruited him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's I mean, nothing. and his father He's really was... not the. He's not the brains behind the operation. He's not controlling anything. He's, he's been groomed his whole life. His family yeah. was, in, you know, Nazi Germany. Yeah. The uh, Eschler Weiss was uh, his father, and then he took over the company. And yeah, I mean, he's been in this game for a very long time. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And he it's was like when you read it. when he you read his it. books, he didn't write these books. He even admits that he's got five other people writing these books, like well, with it's him. Kind of, kind of like Karl yeah. Marx, unquote, right? He, he didn't really write, right. write yeah. them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's why they they never they never call him Doctor Marx because it was a fraud. <laughs> Even though he supposedly had a PhD, well, I thought right? it was because but... he was against the class system, so he didn't want the title. Uh, oh, <laughs> I, I, yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, I, I thought it was because he, he was a fraud. So, so well, you know what? You brought monkeypox earlier, and, mm. and I, I can't, it, it sounds so silly just saying that because I've seen the articles. Um, I don't know where I necessarily sit. I don't think that this is going to take off like COVID did. And I will 100% admit when I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, I don't know what to make of it yet because it's still so early, but it, I didn't know that the World Economic Forum had already kind of had a plan in hand for this whole deal. So yeah, uh, I mean, they, yeah. they want to roll out the next phase of the lockdowns and the, all the tyrannical measures. And they, they want to, that's why they're rolling out the fear porn right now. I mean, that is in their plans. So, you know, they, the COVID was a beta test. It was yeah. to see how people, and Klaus talks about that in his book, right? You know, all the lessons that we're going to learn. And this time they're talking about how it's tied to the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're very big these, on these, that. These, these manufactured uh, <laughs> illnesses, quote unquote viruses, mm -hmm. are yeah. somehow cause, affecting climate and we need and to race in be... race relations don't forget the racist too right of course so we well, this one's not racist this one's homophobic <laughs> right that's right. the only reason i think it's natural is because it's targeting gay people 
<laughs> yeah, it was definitely not natural. But yeah, and and did this look familiar to anybody? Just give Remember me my 80? joke. Come on, man, give me the joke. <laughs> <laughs> did this not remind anybody of anything that happened in the past with AIDS? Yeah, Fauci did a great job then. Yeah. yeah. It's just, I, I just think we play the same playbooks over and over and over again. Then we're supposed to buy the lies. I don't I, know, Kyle. I hope you're right that people don't are not going to fall for it this time. But uh, I I don't know. Well, I, also is it to to kind of lay out my thinking surrounding that, it, it's like it, it's almost like the same deal with trying to say that you're going to have climate lockdowns. Like, could they do it? Sure. But the problem is that the climate change narrative, although a lot of people buy into it, and it's definitely something like the World Economic Forum talks about a lot, um, it's just not quite as tangible. So like COVID, a lot of people knew people who had COVID. Like after the first six months, I knew so many people that had COVID and so did everybody else, right? When it comes my to dad monkey, got fucked up by it. Right. And, and so did, my mom did. She got it about two years in. And I mean, it really fucked up. But I mean, once again, she's 53 years old. She had breast cancer three times. And, mm. oh, you know, she had a lot of comorbidities and once again caveats she's not a bad person she just she's just in that vulnerable group so yeah it really fucking walloped her but i feel like until monkeypox really gets around if it does uh and i'm not saying it can't like i said earlier um it, it's just not going to be tangible enough for people to really bite on the fear point and i'm sure there's people already like walking the doors on their house and well stocking i mean up. So what they're already doing is rolling out the vaccines. So they've already done that. Oh, really? Country. Yeah. Oh. And yeah, well, yeah, they brought, they, they, they uh, introduced the vaccines in 2019. For yeah. monkeypox? Yes. Yes, of course. Oh, man. I, yeah, I've been way behind the ball on this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was just, it was just November of last year uh. whenever, Bill Gates was talking about the next the next pandemic is going to oh, be yeah, they were all talking. Yeah. He said it's going to be a bioterrorist attack of smallpox. Uh, that's right. And the new smallpox the vaccine way. was developed. Well, it was actually approved. It was actually developed in like 2015. It was approved by the FDA in 2019. This yeah. vaccine is already approved. It's already approved. So by the way, I don't know if you guys remember, Biden kept saying dark winter, right? Yeah, a winter dark, of severe illness and death. So dark winter was literally a war game, like, you know, yep. <laughs> yeah, when they, for smallpox. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, it was like it was like that tweet I put out the other day, man. I was like, you know, they in 2019, they had event 201 and the FDA approved the, the new smallpox var uh, vaccine variant. Nice. In 2020, COVID-19, which replicated Event 201 hit. Then in 2021, Bill Gates warns of a smallpox uh, infestation pandemic. <laughs> and in 2022, we have the monkeypox. It's, it's, it's all, it, but there's nothing to see here. It's all coincidence. Mm -hmm. Dude, totally coincidence. It always, but, but it's, the coincidence always goes in one direction. You ever notice that? <laughs> Yeah, it's just this really like bizarre phenomenon, you know, mm -hmm. just sort of random. <laughs> so, <laughs> my God, I mean, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah like it's in t here. Here's one for you. In 2017, Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates had formulated a, a, a breast milk in the laboratory. Yeah, it took them eleven milk. months. It's, it it it's took them bio milk. Bio, bio milk. Yeah. It took mm -hmm. them 11 months to perfect it and get all the nutrients. Suddenly, we have a baby mm -hmm. formula shortage. There's no they, they, it, it It always works in one direction. It, it's just this bizarre coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Biomilk. Uh, it's, it's really, yeah. I, like I, I'll give them. All right, like you were, you were really smart and create in in and ripped off a bunch of your your, you know, uh, business partners and took sole ownership of Microsoft. Fine, but like, how did you know about all this other stuff? You know, like, well, I mean, Gates has been groomed again. It's in right, the family. I mean, right. I, right? I'm, just, I'm being a smartass. You know, halfway. It's 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 just. 
you you can only be lucky so many times yeah no i mean these people have been groomed i i do think they're they're figureheads and you know they keep a lot of the the players in the dark until they're ready to showcase so i mean for a long time nobody knew who you you've all know harari was and now that they're really rolling out a lot of this uh you know ai biotech mm -hmm. uh they 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 need to condition people right so they're yeah. they're bringing him to the forefront to uh couch it in these uh seemingly poetic <laughs> language that yeah. you know makes people feel like you know what he's doing is are really and these ideas are really wonderful and i i know a lot of people who are falling for it mm -hmm. um but you know what he's what he's talking about is actually really horrifying. He's literally saying that we will cease to have consciousness, that you know we do not have a soul, uh, that it's already happening. Uh, he talks about you know the he likens to uh, the flood, and he says how you know he talks about Noah's Ark, and he says the the, the masses will not handle this uh, it, you know the advances of technology very well, uh, but that there will be a scientific ark that is created for the elites. He literally says this stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, they they were saying that uh, the people, whether they like it or not, they're going to be chipped, and that it's already mm -hmm. happened. That people have already been chipped. Uh, they're already being tracked, and they've already been being traced and controlled. Uh, I mean, they've they've said this. It's it's all out there. I think this uh, kind of. Uh, Do you have anything else? No, I could okay. go on. I mean, I yeah. We can, okay. I mean, these, yeah. these subjects can go. I mean, we can talk about these things for yeah. years. I could tell. There's, there's no way to. <laughs> it, it's so hard. And this is why I, this is kind of why I, I construct my podcast the way I do what we were talking about earlier, the way I, I break things down, the way I talk about them is because it, they're so complex. They're so nuanced. There's so much mm -hmm. in there that you can dig deep into that. It's like, how do you get somebody to comprehend what is what you're telling them? The only right. way to do it is to hold back a lot of the information and try yeah. to break it down in the terms that are very easy to digest. And it's yeah. not easy to do because I'll never be able to cover every subject because the way I do it is so I'd hate to say dumbed down because I don't think that's it, but it's so kind of elementary version of it. Right. And it's more of a yeah. introduction. You're giving them the, the introduction, which is right. so great. I, I really, I have a lot of respect for you being able to do that. I, I wish I had more of the patience for that. I, but. Well, you have <laughs> the patience. I'm just, you, but. you have the patience to do the digging and the research. Cause I, I, I see you on your story all the time, you know, flipping through all these papers and doing all this reading. So th there's definitely a need for both, but, um, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I what, what I want to do is I, I've always like, I, I've always had like the ultimate respect for people like Richard Grove, who's a really good friend of mine, Jay mm -hmm. Dyer, uh, mm -hmm. Courtney, you know, you know, these people are doing, such great intensive work patrick wood um uh, mm -hmm. james corbett. corbett yeah like these guys yeah. are like down in the weeds right yeah so it's like how do i fit into the scenario and it's like right. well i'm an average guy i talk to average people all the time i yeah. can direct people to this information so so yeah. that's kind of the role i've taken it's like, yeah, I know this great. stuff and I can talk this stuff and I can get down into it, but I don't feel like that's my place. I feel like there yeah. are people that are much more qualified to do that, that I mm -hmm. have a different set of, of qualifications. I'm very good with conversation. I'm very good with in, interacting with people mm -hmm. and getting people to open up and, and to bring things out to a level that is easy for everybody to understand. Right. Yeah. Think about, I, I think about the the interview i just did with john rob right john rob works for a think tank he was part of seal mm -hmm. team six like he's part of the state department like i one of my listeners heard me talking about some stuff and said look i want you to talk to this guy because i think you can open this guy up to talk about things in a different way mm -hmm. and so i got him on and that listener contacted me he's like i've never heard him talk about things like that 
And wow. so I was like, okay, I'm doing what I was supposed to do. Yeah. Like, and it's just, that's my, that's kind of what I'm good at. It's kind of yeah. like the way I engage people. I, I'm kind of disarming because I'm just a stupid redneck that likes to tell jokes. <laughs> right. I, I don't know that that's a hundred percent true. But <laughs> <laughs> you like to tell jokes. Two thirds. Two thirds. <laughs> yeah. The um, stupid redneck part is definitely true. <laughs> the jokes go. aren't good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think. I mean, you, you know, I, I think Kyle knows. Like, I, I always talk about it. I think it, that we're, you know, each one of us are endowed with unique gifts, and it is incumbent upon us to, yeah. you know, discover them and harness them so mm -hmm. that we can be of contribution. And everybody right. does have it. It's a, I think of it like an ecosystem. We all have a different role to play, and I, I think that's really great. We do need people to bridge that gap. It's. And it's not an easy thing to do because I, yeah, I, I've had conversations with people and it's like, you usually don't get somebody who will, cause people don't like to admit they're wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. And I have a really hard time holding back. I, you know, I, I understand there's time and place for things and I'm not going to be rude or, you know, uh, inappropriate if I, you know, deem that that's not what needs to be done, but I, I've definitely had, you know, there are times where people have really just thought I was completely crazy and actually come back to me maybe six months, a year later and says, wow, you were 100% right. And I have no idea how you knew that, you know, thank you for kind of, we need a, eyes. we need so a Courtney was normally... right tip jar. What? <laughs> I, what I, said, I said, we need a Courtney was right tip jar. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I don't need to get that. And you're very rarely going to get it, you know. Um, but I, it, but the few times that I have gone, it, it makes me feel like, okay, you know, it, it needs to be done. Because, because I know from my own experience, right, like there were people who, as I was saying, they planted those seeds. And if they hadn't planted those seeds, and I'm talking years ago, yeah. then I don't know that I would have you know, done this kind, made these connections that I made now. Right. You know, a lot of it was because those seeds have been planted years ago when I kind of brushed it off. I was like, I don't know about all that. It's a little crazy, right? Mm -hmm. And then as I started to dive into the stuff, I saw it so clearly because now I was ready to see it. So I think planting seeds is a really great strategy for people. Mm. Right. It, it's uh, people love to use the uh, red pill analogy and I kind of hate it in the political context just because I don't see it that way. But um, mm -hmm. it, it's you can't because you haven't taken a red pill yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, you're supposed to take one pill at a time. You're not supposed to overdose on the bomb, right? You have That's to. That's what Malice says, but I think he's wrong. Look well, at me. You... I'm perfectly fine. Unless you take the black pill and then you just take the whole bottle. Cause yeah. Right. Well, yeah, just doom and gloom. Oh, now, so I'm... It's hard, though, when you're digging into the stuff not to get nihilistic sometimes. Oh, yeah. It, it definitely is. Well, and, well... and that's why you have to have hobbies. You have to take oh, days off. Yes. You, you, can't, you can't just do it all the time. Well, I put out I, that. Or I can't. It drives me crazy. But And, and my wife doesn't want to hear it. She's mm -hmm. like, only tell me if it's important. If, if it's going to affect me today, then I want to know. Otherwise, I don't care. And it's yeah. like, okay, well, I got to go do a podcast. So I got to talk to somebody about this shit. <laughs> yeah, know? so that, that's kind of why I put out that tweet the other day, especially after this past weekend. Um, I, I said, libertarian, go outside and uh, don't be autistic and be normal or like touch socialize grasp. with people. Yeah, touch grass. It was something <laughs> like that. I said some kind of tweet like that, but... Um, you know, I spent the weekend kind of away from political thought and, you know, my band played Friday night, we played Saturday and I was just around other people kind of enjoying life. And, you know, some may say ignorance is bliss, but, uh, you know, sometimes you do have to have those moments where you kind of, I don't want to even just say unplug, but you can kind of just go live life and appreciate <laughs> things for what they are rather than having to myopically focus on specific political things or different work that you have to do it's it's good to just be around people and enjoy that and honestly yeah. to, to kind of complement what we're talking about here when it comes to this fourth industrial revolution the way that i see it is they kind of want to take that away right they want to put you in the pods to eat bugs the, the metaverse <laughs> right they'll plug you into the metaverse where you can no longer 
be outside in the sun where you can no longer feel that human human connection because there's something about being next to somebody and it's the Millville Music Festival and this guy has a beer and he's telling you about how much he likes your guitar tone and going and seeing different people walking down the street and going to mm. a restaurant and enjoying food with my fiance and a friend that there's you don't you can't get that in the metaverse right you can't get that when technology is being fed you and especially if they're going to have these ESG scores where okay you had too much meat this month so your score is too low so you can no longer have this specific thing and we, right and that's my that's been my thing for over a year I'm surprised yeah. we didn't get into that more in detail mm -hmm. <laughs> I can go mm -hmm. on about that forever <laughs> but you know um oh yeah I've, I've been so I did oh yeah I, I've done I've done several episodes on ESG. I did one with James Corbett. Yeah. So the one interestingly enough, you mentioned uh, Glenn Beck and, uh, you know, I don't always uh, align with him, but hey, he's done some really great work on the ESG stuff. His, really his book, his book, The Great Reset, if you haven't, if you haven't read it, I would suggest reading it. it it's actually yeah. pretty good. I bought it and I, what I found was it was a very good introduction to, e yeah, to, to, to The imagine. Great Reset. Yeah, he, he he has a very, I like his writing style. He's a very good writer. Okay. And um, so uh, I've read quite a few of his books. I, I used to be a huge fan of his. I still watch him regularly. I disagree with him probably more than I agree with him. But <laughs> I, I at least respect the fact that I think he's honest. Mm -hmm. Like it, It's like a, a Glenn Greenwald, Matt Taibbi, uh, Michael Tracy, Glenn Beck, uh, Kyle Kalinske, Jimmy Dore. Like there are certain people that I disagree with vehemently, mm -hmm. constantly. That I at mm -hmm. least think they're trying to be honest. Yeah. And well, I, I don't. If you, if, I don't ask to trying, agree. I'm never going to agree with any 100 percent of anything anybody says because yeah. they're not me, right? Right. I, right I, if they're right. as long as they're honest and uh, you know they're they're authentic in their uh, their quest, then I can respect that. Absolutely. Right. And and so whenever it comes to like media and. And keeping up with news, like even Tim Pool, I'll, I'll check him out because I do think he's being honest, at least for the most mm -hmm. part. Um, there, there are several things, especially on China, that I disagree with him on. But <laughs> and, there's a lot I disagree with him on, and I don't always feel he's super honest. I think he's he panders quite a bit. You know? Oh yeah, but, the Civil War yeah. stuff. Every day there's going to be a new Civil War. Every day, just ask them. So it, it, there's going to be a new Civil War every day. So you have to buy my ration food at five hundred dollars for a bucket. Oh well, uh, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> there, there is definitely a grift there. Oh yeah. Um, so maybe, maybe I can. I'll, I'll, I'll get in touch with Hotep Jesus and see if we can't get him a grifties. Um, so. But, uh, yeah, no. So, I mean, that's kind of my thing, but you brought up earlier how they, um, and I don't, I don't know how you want to go Kyle. So I, cause I, I'm sure her and I could keep talking all night. Um, but she brought up earlier about how they, how they slowly reveal these like names and these subjects and these ideas out to people. I have you noticed here recently, one of the things I've noticed in the last couple of weeks is I'm starting to see the term technocrat floated yeah. around more yeah it, it's starting I mean, to hit the mainstream and i was like the first time i saw that i was like i actually tweeted it out i was like it's kind of interesting i'm starting to see technocrat like hit mainstream articles i saw it in reason and you know here and i'm like wait what like that wasn't something anybody would openly say they wouldn't even they wouldn't even call it a conspiracy theory they just acted like the term didn't exist for the right. longest and then here recently it's just like oh it's just a term you know yada yada yeah i mean even though it's been around since uh smith right right, right. you can coin the, the, the terms it's like over a hundred years ago um yeah. so it's, it's not exactly like it's a new term yeah it's not <laughs> but, like they yeah. just figured this term out <laughs> so right. does that ever concern you guys when you kind of see something like that <laughs> oh that's okay yes sorry <laughs> Uh, yeah. Does it ever concern you when you see something like that kind of going mainstream? Do you ever think that maybe there's a reason? Like, it, so when you see technocrat floating around, um, originally it kind of is more of like in that conspiracy theory kind of realm. Does it concern you guys when you see that kind of getting put out there? 
Nah, not not necessarily because it it just it's a signal to me that I'm at least aware of where where they're going, and so I kind of have an understanding of what what it is that's happening, and oh. it, it it makes it easy for me to talk about. It. It's kind of like um, it, you're watching you're watching Edward Bernays in action. Mm. Mm -hmm. is, is yeah, what you're doing yeah. and so there's actually kind of a respectability to it because it's like wow like you've actually figured out how to utilize all these rules you figured out how to do this and so there is some amount of respect for the enemy in that in that <laughs> scenario you know what i'm saying like i'm not wrong here <laughs> <laughs> well I, I don't know when when they start rolling things out to me what it says is that they're they're getting really close to ramping something up um and they need to uh desensitize the masses so it's essentially like a predictive programming type of uh, mechanism because if you were to if you were to just roll out you know whatever a lot of these measures are then most people would fight back it, it's yeah. kind of like you know, they couldn't go straight from, uh, you know, a, an outbreak of a COVID to like everybody needs to be locked down for two years and you and everybody has to get, you know, injected like that. They couldn't have started with that. That's right. why it was like two weeks. We're going to flatten the curve, you know, and uh, then, you know, let, let's wear masks for a little bit. And of course, it turned into two years, and then you know, so forth, so on. But they they have to condition you, so I, I think that's kind of how this works, where they, things are working behind the scenes for a very long time, and then they slow drip things to kind of get people prepared, so that they're in a way desensitized, so that they acquiesce, because otherwise, it would be much harder pill to swallow. Yeah, if, and, if they start calling senators Machiavellians and congressmen uh, the managerial class, I might be more concerned. Say that again. <laughs> I said if they start calling senators Machiavellians and <laughs> the con and Congress the mm -hmm. managerial class, I might get more concerned. <laughs> but no, it, it, to me, I, I guess it's because the what I read and the amount I read what I'm mm -hmm. keeping up with to me, it's just a signal of what the next move is. So yeah, I, is. I don't get concerned. No, it does not concern me because well, it, it wouldn't just, concern. I, I, because I, I understand, because I understand what's happening. Right. So I don't know if concerned is the right word per se. Uh, we wouldn't be, but I, I understand. I think I I'm not excited about it. I'm not happy with it. <laughs> right. I would think. But, yeah. but it basically I think like, what did Kyle is asking is, yeah, exactly. Like Kyle's asking. Yeah, it, it definitely grabs my attention. I don't want to put words attention. in your mouth, Kyle, but I, I think you're asking, like, do you think that it is an indication of what's to come? Yeah. Like, is yeah. there a reason why? And I, I think absolutely. You know, I, I do think that they, they they tell you their plans. I mean, that, that's the thing I always say. I'm like, they tell you their plans, and people tell me I'm crazy. But I'm like, look, it's right there. Go yeah, it definitely, it. it definitely does grab my attention when I see, like, that, and that's why I brought up. The, the fact that I've seen technocrat here recently, it, it grabs yeah. my attention. It's like nobody else is talking about this. It was like when you, when you looked at, um, I don't know if either of you read the summary of 2022 Davos, right? Did, I, did either of y'all read the summary of what nah. it was about prior to it starting? Wait, of, of when? I, I'm, of da which summary? Uh, Davos this year. Did you read oh, the this summary? Year. This year's no. summary. Okay. I, so maybe. one of the things that one of the things that popped out to me is they said um, uh, that they're part of the plan of of the seminar for Davos is is ch the challenges of operating in a multipolar world. Mm -hmm. So they're they're basically admitting that Russia already won, that it's no longer a unipolar world. Oh, right. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like I see things like that. Yeah. It catches my, I actually, I, I tweeted out the picture and I highlighted multipolar world. Cause I was like, where, when did this happen? Just yesterday it was a unipolar world. Now it's a multipolar world. Like what's going on? What do they know that we don't know? Right. You know? So, uh, I, I guess we could probably close on this, but, uh, 
it's funny. They're all saying that Biden had a gaffe, right? A gaffe, as he usually does. But um, I think it wasn't a gaffe when he said that we will militarily defend Taiwan. And well, it was a gaffe in as much as he wasn't supposed to say it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well then, yeah, fair <laughs> enough. If you consider that a gaffe, then yes. But he said, you know, over a year ago that they, that the American military or that America would militarily defend Taiwan if China were to attack. Um, that's interesting that they said it's a multipolar world now. And, yeah. and then once idea. again, the president comes out today and says we will militarily defend Taiwan. Well, well, something else has happened that people haven't been reporting on, mm -hmm. right? So the other day, the Chinese Communist Party came out and sent an internal memo amongst uh, the, the members of the party telling them to pull their resources from foreign uh, governments, so from foreign countries, because they don't want the same type of sanctions to come on them as came on Russia. They don't want the same impact that it had yeah. on Russia. So they're preparing to go into Taiwan. So this is something that, that this is something that he's being. I'll, I'll hold on. I'll find it for you real quick. I'll I'll read you the headline. Okay. Um, it's Wall yeah. Street Journal. I'm not going to pay to read it. Oh. Yeah. No. It's it's interesting. That's okay. China. Um, go here it is. Right here it is. Right here. first page. China insists party elites shed overseas assets, eyeing Western sanctions on Russia. So they're, they're demanding, and there have been many Chinese oligarchs already that have sold portions of businesses that they have, that they own in other countries. So they're, they're already making the, they're making the moves to go into Taiwan, mm -hmm. right? So Biden, I think said something he wasn't supposed to say and what he was supposed to do was give a clear signal to China that it would not be smart. But China saw how corporations and governments reacted when Russia went into Ukraine. And they've been watching very patiently as to how it's operating. And Russia is about to pull off their objective. They're, they, I mean, they've run Ukrainians out of Mariupol. They've, they've almost completely taken Donbass which is what they wanted the entire time. They want that buffer region in between NATO states and Russia. And so China has been watching and China said, okay, in order to set ourselves up for a better situation to where we don't have to deal with the financial uh, devastation of these sanctions and of these corporations pulling out of China, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and sell our assets in foreign nations. And we're going to prepare our wealthy elites for the brunt of America's attack. So now America's left with no choice but direct action. There's no indirect action now. There's right. no financial war that can be waged on the Chinese oligarchs. You have no choice but direct action. And so Biden said something he probably wasn't supposed to say, but is probably true. Yeah, and that's terrifying because even amongst um, a lot of Republicans, even like good MAGA first or America first Republicans, they're very, very bad on China. The oh, constantly. yeah, absolutely. They're so th this is like universal government support is, you know. And, a, you don't, and you, if you don't think the left is going to have fucking Taiwan flags in their fucking profiles, <laughs> before noon you're fucking mistaken oh yeah yeah and even like ro Khanna, someone who's really good on foreign policy he's even hawkish on china so like this is like the entire squad thing. is the yeah. entire squad is right it, it, so that's because they're all sellouts they mm -hmm. all work for the same people they're all getting paid from the same fucking coffers they're they're this is it's all a game they play there are very few that are honest in dc and massey we have to, Massey, <laughs> that's about Paul, it. Paul, Paul, Marjorie Taylor Green, mm -hmm. you know those but types. And even, Marjorie, I mean, yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Sorry. Well, I, I mean, I was going to say Paul. I mean, I, yeah. I love what he did with the recent bill, uh, you know, stopping the Ukraine bill. But mm -hmm. I mean, he's had the goods on Fauci, and he the, he's not doing anything because it 
it's more expedient for him to use it to leverage for campaign. campaign. Actually, I, I think I think with that, it's 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 a matter of waiting for Republicans to have some sort of majority so they can actually do anything. I don't think even so. If he, he could, no, even if he, he files he actually, something. He has all of the information that he needs. Oh, I know he. I know. I know he does, and I, yeah, I don't disagree with that. And I think he's that. not doing it because he's using it as because his uh, talking about it is better for campaigning. His dad taught him morals too well. All right. Yeah, exactly. If he if he were if he were a Democrat, he would have already leaked it to the New York Times. Yeah, and he's not doing it. <laughs> it's not about leaking. He doesn't need to leak it. No, but I'm saying the, the information would already be out there. We it would be public knowledge. The fact of the matter is that he he, he doesn't. doesn't he have, thinks I'm that, not even talking about le leaking. I mean, he it, it's he he has information that would incriminate him. Right, but there yeah. would never be any charges pushed because of who's in charge. So, like, I think what he's waiting for, and I could be totally wrong. It was just kind of my read on it is that he's waiting for Republicans to be in office because he wants to go through the legal process, like morally uh, right. he thinks doing it any other way is wrong. And the only way to but he has it, enough to go through the legal process now, but the Democrats would never approve it. They would just shut it down. You see what I'm saying? Like the Republicans need uh, to have, have the control of the Senate for that to move forward. Yeah, I would. I, 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 I mean, that's just my view. Now, if let's say yeah. the Republicans take the Senate in November and nothing moves forward, then I'm going to be like, with you. I'm going to be like, yeah, he's just a sellout. You know, right. so I'm just kind of giving them the benefit of the doubt at this period of time. Hey, I hope you're right. I, I, I mean, well, I just understand how it works that if he did bring the charges up right now, like yeah. it would go nowhere. Do, right. Does any is anybody even aware that there were impeachment that there's an impeachment of Biden that was brought forward the first day he was in office? Well, Marjorie, Marjorie yeah. yeah, but yeah, it, she filed for an impeachment of Biden, but it didn't go anywhere yeah. because they didn't have they don't have control. They well, can't and do the thing about Marjorie Taylor Greene, I like her on some stuff, but then so like she's pretty bad on china as well but it, oh, there, yeah. there's there's yeah, a tweet absolutely. she said china's fake but economy she... but then she'll say china's the biggest threat and then she tried to file articles of impeachment against joe biden for the eviction moratorium okay Here's well, why I don't, who I started don't, the eviction moratorium <laughs> i i do not talk shit about marjorie taylor green for one reason and one reason only mm -hmm. like i yeah. said earlier she is the she's epitome. honest she is well, she, yeah She's the epitome you, of every person I deal with on a daily basis. Yeah. And I mean, it's like, the, okay, I don't always agree you're with an her, average American. Like yeah. she's not reading these books or the books that Courtney has not behind only, her. But not but only that. She is honest. Only, I, I do believe she's, she's honest. honest. Yeah. yeah. You know, she's I think she authentic. really believes what she's doing yes, is right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, no. and I, I, you know, I, I support that. I have so much, uh, I give yeah. her so much credit because she, she, she's willing to stand for her convictions. I, and like I said, I don't have to always agree with her, but we need yeah. a lot more people who are authentically pursuing, Absolutely. you know, defense of their convictions. Yeah. And Absolutely. that's where I 100% agree as well. I just criticize her when she's bad and I have endless amounts of praise for her when she's good, because actually a majority of the time she is good on just about everything yeah, it, it, yeah and all i'm saying is i don't criticize her when she's bad because i know mm -hmm. she's she's going into it with a lack of information 90 percent of the time totally when yep. she's wrong okay yeah yeah and, and, and like there are things she does that drive me crazy mm -hmm. but i just scream at the wall and you know slam my face yeah, well it, it, it's the you know uh, it's like a, rather, it's like a bad I, breakup I know they, you know i'd rather have 365 <laughs> of her uh than, yeah yeah yeah, you know, because I'll at least I at least I know she's where she's coming from. She yeah. there you you got to look at at where she's been and how many times she's been approached in her role mm -hmm. and told to shut up and offered to been bought, bought out and understand that that's going on behind the scenes constantly. Yeah. And well, she's not taking it. She's like, yeah. "No, I was elected to do a job and I'm going to do my job." It was, now, yeah. Even though she's working off, off of false premises a lot of times or off of false information, bad information, whatever it is, I can at least respect the fact that she's coming at it as an average, normal, everyday American and trying yeah. to do the best she can. I can't hold that against her. And I just, I don't bad mouth her because I kind of give her the benefit of the doubt. Mm-hmm. 
Sure. No, that's completely understandable. Um, mm -hmm. And like I said, I have a lot of admiration for her, especially because she was a, a power lifter she, at one point. She's tough, man. Yeah. She's and and it, it's, it's similar to like the Ron Paul story, right? Because everybody knew who the sole, you know, one lobbyist Nova wouldn't was. even visit him. Yep. Visit him. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. So there's something to be, you know, something to be said for someone like that. I think Marjorie Taylor Greene, um, although she is a far cry from Ron Paul, there's still something very admirable about yes. being that one okay. sole no vote and being an outspoken person with your convictions and right. like i said we all don't agree with her at 100 percent of the time but jesus christ you know the age-old economist question compared to what <laughs> yeah <laughs> compared exactly. to right. what <laughs> listen to the Damn. if you listen to what she said on the on the floor uh of the house whenever they were uh going for the 40 billion for ukraine <laughs> right like I, I know what she's like proposing is bad economics, mm -hmm. but I also know that what she's saying is what most Americans are thinking. Yeah. You have $40 billion for Ukraine, but we can't feed our children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like that's what most people think. Mm -hmm. Like, why do you have this money for these people? But we, we can't even feed our babies. We can't get formula. Yeah right mm -hmm. you see what i'm saying and so she's saying something that's actually real mm -hmm. right she, exactly. you know, she hits the and heart so, of the people it, or, or when she forces uh congress to vote on on issues instead of just rubber stamping them yeah. like i'm like right. that's not an easy thing to do everybody hates her because of that right. because yeah. she forces them to show up to work right <laughs> funny how that works <laughs> yeah you, no, you, so no. so that's why i don't even like if she does something that i disagree with i just keep my mouth shut mm -hmm. right. whereas like a dan crenshaw does something i disagree with i'll never let him live it down yeah yeah well it kind of shows how long i came my political thoughts i used to like him a lot probably about four or five years ago but uh you know it don't take a lot of digging to figure out he's a he's a fucking scumbag yeah well <laughs> I have my own like issues with him being a scumbag. Yeah, his well, cousin, his cousin's not so bad. Beatrix used to work for his cousin. Oh, his cousin is an attorney here in uh, in our area, and Beatrix used to work for him, and he's actually a really good guy. And so the fact that Dan Crenshaw is such a scumbag is very disappointing because we actually thought, wow, you know, this would be a nice, normal, average Texas guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. nope not so much rank so it's and very, file yeah, it's very which is probably why i'm so hard on him mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. so jeez all right guys um we've been going for a decent while now um courtney any closing thoughts um no i mean this has been great yeah i learned a lot so thank you <laughs> well we'll uh we'll definitely have to have a round two because uh i feel like there was a little bit of i don't want to say shaking off the rust but kind of clearing some minutia to get to a little bit more substance and uh i think you guys have a lot of uh kind of similarities about the way you guys look at things and kind of the research as you do um tommy's kind of like the guy holding the door and then you're the uh, lady behind the desk uh, handing out all the uh, papers which is really really neat uh tommy same question closing thoughts happy 100th man thank you it's a yeah. big milestone i remember when i hit my hundred. yeah mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I've, I've been going since um october so it's uh, a little over seven months and that's, uh, that's quick to hit 100 too, that's man. very quick yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, me, sure. I, think, I think it was almost two years for me mm -hmm. so before I hit 100. Well, uh, it, it's been an uh, absolute honor to uh, have both you guys on here. Uh, Tommy, I think this is your third. Courtney, this is your second. And uh, I did Courtney's show. I did, uh, Tommy, mm -hmm. I did your show twice. And I did a live stream with Courtney and Yale as well. So, um, you know, th this has just been one of the coolest things I've been able to do in the last year. And uh, just getting to meet all the people and just you know being a part of the uh liberty in the podcasting sphere is just really really cool and everybody's been absolutely incredible to me and uh you guys are no exception to that awesome man well mm -hmm. we're i'm really happy for you and i'm proud of you dude you just keep on rolling yeah, thanks man always got your back. and it was great meeting you courtney and i'm glad we got to argue a little bit it was a lot of fun I, love <laughs> arguing. I, I don't mind arguing with women as long as i'm not arguing as long as that woman's not my wife <laughs> 
<laughs> I didn't really think we were arguing, but uh, <laughs> yeah, well, like, like I said, it was just kind of clearing the minutiae. Yeah, no, we were, where everybody was. Yeah, like yeah. I, I think a lot of times when something like that occurs, it's a lack of defining terms, and that was exactly just, that well, was just I, much yeah, my fault. I was as, on the debate you know, team. I'm all about defining the terms. <laughs> yeah, so we should yeah. we should probably do that. But yeah, I'll definitely uh, we're we're definitely gonna have to do this again. I would I would talk to y'all anytime. Nice. Yeah, likewise. Likewise. Super fun. All right. Well, uh, thank you guys for being on for the 100th episode. And uh, hopefully everyone enjoyed. Like, subscribe, and share. I'm, I'm terrible at telling people to do that. I always do it at the end. I know. You should probably I do never it up remember. Front. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, like I said, hopefully everybody enjoyed. I know I did. And I'm going to have to give this another uh, listen through. I say that with a lot of podcasts. But uh, this one especially just because this was a lot of fun. So, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Real quick. Plugs. Where can everybody find you guys? Go ahead, Miss Courtney. All right. Well, you can definitely find me on the Courtney Turner podcast, and I, I am pretty much everywhere that you can find podcasts. Unfortunately, YouTube is taking down some of my videos, but I am on there, um, and I'm on uh, BitChute, Rumble, Odyssey, Rockfin. I have all my stuff on all the audio platforms. So I'm on Apple, Spotify, um, Podbean, and iHeartRadio, and uh yeah, you can find me on social media at Courtney Turner on Truth Social on Twitter at Kinetic Courts on Instagram. Cool, Tommy. Yeah, I'm I'm really easy to find. LibertarianInstitute.org forward slash year dash zero forward slash. You gotta have that second forward slash. Fucking Harley, man. I gotta talk to this guy about this. That for that second forward slash is such a pain in the ass. I, you know how many times I forgot to say that. And people are like, I can't find your podcast. I'm like, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what to do. I would type it in. I'm like, I can't find it either. I don't know where it's at. So it's libertarianinstitute.org forward slash year dash zero forward slash. That's where you find me. Cool. All right, guys. Well, uh, one more time. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for being a part of my adventure here. And uh, we'll definitely do it again. Yeah. Awesome. For sure, dude. Yeah. Cool.